Summary of the Devil and Tom Walker by Washington Irving Before telling the story of Tom Walker, the narrator tells us about the pirate Captain Kidd, who buried his stolen wealth in a swamp not far from Boston, Massachusetts, a long time ago. Old stories say that the devil himself, who is called Old Scratch, is keeping watch over the money, as he always does with buried wealth that was stolen. Kidd never got to enjoy his money, though, because he was caught in Boston not long after he buried it and then put to death in England for his crimes. The real story begins in 1727. Tom Walker is mean and incredibly greedy. He lives near the swamp with his wife, who is also mean, greedy, and abusive. Their house is sad, broken down, and has an air of starvation about it, just like their horribly thin horse. One night, Tom is taking a shortcut home through the swamp when he comes across the ruins of an old Indian fort. He decides to rest there. As he pokes around with his staff, he finds an old skull and kicks it to get the dirt off of it. Let that skull be, says a voice, which belongs to the devil old Scratch, who has a completely black face, as if it were covered in soot, and carries an axe. Old Scratch tells Tom that this swampland doesn't belong to the famous Boston religious leader Deacon Peabody, as Tom thinks, but to Old Scratch himself. To prove it, he shows Tom a tree with the deacon's name carved on it. The tree looks healthy on the outside, but the inside is rotten, just like Peabody, who is successful in the eyes of the world but morally bad and going to hell. All of the nearby trees have the names of great men from the settlement, including the one Tom is sitting on, which is called Crown and Shield. The devil tells Tom that Crown and Shield is ready to burn because he made a lot of money from piracy. Tom and Old Scratch walk to Tom's house together and talk seriously about Captain Kidd's pirate treasure and a business deal, which is probably that Tom will sell his soul to the devil in exchange for Kidd's wealth. Tom needs time to think about it. When he asks for proof that what the devil says is true, Old Scratch puts his finger to Tom's forehead and leaves his signature, a black, permanent mark. At home, Tom's wife tells him that Absalom Crowninshield's death was just reported which makes him think that the devil was right. Also, Tom finally tells his wife what happened in the swamp. He had kept it a secret from her because he had met Old Scratch in person. Tom's wife wants to get her hands on Kid's gold, so she tells him to take the devil's offer. Tom decides not to do it, though, just to get back at her. So, his wife chooses to make a deal with Old Scratch herself. She goes to the old Indian fort one evening without fear, only to come back late that night feeling sad and having failed. She decides that on her second try, she needs to give the devil something. Without Tom's knowledge, she puts the family's silver in her apron and goes back into the swamp. This time, she doesn't come back. Tom misses his wife more than the silver. The most likely story about what happened to her is that when Tom went to look for her in the swamp a few days later, all he found was her apron which had a heart and liver wrapped up in it. He also found signs that his wife and Old Scratch had fought before the devil beat her. Tom makes up for the loss of his silver by being happy that he has lost his wife. He is even thankful to the devil for helping her fall to her death and hell. He decides that now is the time to sell his soul to the devil in return for Captain Kidd's treasure. After several failed attempts to meet up with Old Scratch, Tom finally does so one night at the edge of the swamp. Slowly but surely, Tom and the devil start to argue about the terms of their deal. For example, the devil now wants Tom to sell his soul and also become a slave dealer. Even though Tom's morals won't let him work in this field, he agrees gladly to become a usurer, someone who lends money with interest, instead. The devil and Tom make a deal, and Tom starts working as a usurer. A few days later, Tom is at his desk in a Boston counting house. He quickly gets a reputation for lending money, which more and more people need because the local economy has recently collapsed under Governor Belcher's watch. Many get-rich-quick schemes and crazy real estate ventures have failed, leaving people with little money and no other options. In fact, Tom's door is soon thronged with customers, who he takes advantage of by charging high interest rates and securing bills harshly. He gets rich quickly and builds a huge, 
showy house that he never finishes or even fills with furniture because he is cheap. He also buys a cart and two horses, but he lets all of these things get in bad shape. As Tom gets older, though, he worries that he might have given up his soul to hell in return for worldly success. So, he starts to do things to avoid giving the devil what he deserves, he goes to church with the same amount of zeal as his sins, he is harsh with his neighbors, and he brings up the idea of persecuting Quakers and Anabaptists as heretics again. He also always has Bibles with him, one in his coat pocket and one on his desk in the counting house, to keep old scratch away. Even crazier, Tom has buried his horse upside down and fully equipped so that on Judgment Day, when the world goes upside down, he can run away from the devil. One hot afternoon, Tom is in the counting house, wearing a silk morning gown, for closing on the land jobber's debt. The land jobber is a broke land investor who begs Tom for a few more months to pay him back. The land swindler tells Tom that he has already made a lot of money off of him, but Tom just says, the devil take me, if I have made a farthing. He is impatient and rude. Right on time, the devil comes to Tom's door with a big black horse. Tom opens the door. Tom, you're mine, the devil tells him, and even though Tom tries to get away, his Bible is crushed on his desk under the mortgage he just took back. So, the devil puts Tom on his black horse and rides away with him as a storm rages around them. Tom Walker never went back to the land jobber's house to foreclose on his debt. One story says that the horse ran with him back to the old Indian fortress, where a lightning strike took them both away. After Tom goes missing, Bostonians who are in charge of taking care of his estate find that there's nothing to take care of, his bonds and mortgages have turned to ashes, his gold and silver have turned into wood chips and filings, his horses have turned into skeletons, and the next day, even his huge house burns down. So ends the story of Tom Walker and his stolen money though it is said that he still rides a horse and wears his morning gown to the old Indian fort in the swamp where he once lived. About the author Washington Irving was a writer who lived in the first half of the 19th century. He is best known today for his stories Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, but he was also a biographer, historian, essayist, and U.S. diplomat. He was born in New York and was named after General George Washington. At the time of his birth in 1783, Washington had not yet been elected president because the Constitution had not been written or passed. Before he got interested in writing about history and short stories, Irving studied law. His writing made him famous and important, especially after he published the sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gent, 1819-1820. He was one of the first American writers whose work was known around the world. He lived in Europe for 17 years, mostly in Britain and Spain, and was well-liked there. He went back to Terrytown, New York, later in life and lived on an estate he called Sunnyside. Before coming back to this house, he was the U.S. ambassador to Spain for four years. He kept writing and keeping in touch with people until he died in 1859. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.